I'm going to talk about uh, cannulation, and uh, uh, the first thing that I mean to mention is, is that uh, selective cannulation is in fact an art uh, and not a science. And I think that um, there will be as many varied opinions uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the part of the faculty about how to cannulate, what to do in difficult cannulations uh, as there are faculty. So I'm giving you my thoughts on uh, cannulation, uh, what to do uh, when you have trouble. But this won't necessarily be the same for all of the faculty, and I, I'm sure it will uh, generate a discussion and there will be uh, differences of opinion. Uh, I break down cannulation into three separate steps. Uh, the first one is basically to engage the orifice. Uh, it's what I call insinuation, uh, but in, it's basically engaging whatever device you're using uh, into the uh, papillary orifice. Uh, the second step um, is to access uh, the correct side of the septum. And uh, I picture uh, within the pancreas, within the, uh, the ampullary orifice, that there's a septum. And you need to get on the correct side of that septum if you want to get selective cannulation, either on the biliary side or on the pancreatic side. And then the third part, uh, and oftentimes the most difficult part, is actually negotiating the intraduodenal portion of the papilla. So once you get into the orifice, once you get on the right side of the septum, you then have to negotiate uh, the intraduodenal portion of the uh, papilla in order to get deep uh, cannulation. And uh, if you look at um, these uh, in sort of a diagrammatic uh, form, uh, here is what you get. Uh, in terms of orientation of the, uh, the three factors that affect you getting uh, the correct uh, side of the septum, is the orientation of the septum. And actually, the septum can be oriented in different ways. Um, it's not always this traditional way where we teach that you go at 11 o'clock and you'll get the bile duct, you go at, at 5 o'clock and you'll get the, uh, the pancreatic duct. Sometimes the septum can be different, uh, different uh, lined up differently, and you, uh, you have to be able to recognize that or at least probe in different uh, places to overcome it. The second uh, factor in, in terms of getting on the correct side of the septum is the length of the common channel. And I have that diagrammed here. In cases where the, the, uh, there is a very, very short or no common channel, then it becomes relatively easy to select uh, uh, the, which side of the septum you want to go on. But if it is a very long uh, uh, common channel, then it can be very difficult because oftentimes um, uh, you, you have to go in quite deeply to get uh, the up before you get the upward curve uh, to get uh, into the bile duct. And so the length of the septum, or the length of the uh, common channel rather, can affect uh, how you cannulate. And then finally, if you get a pancreatic cannulation, uh, as an example, uh, first off, and you really want to get a biliary cannulation, I think what happens is that the septum sort of gets plastered um, against the wall, uh, the upper wall of the papilla. And if it gets plastered, if, if a sort of a channel is made in the bottom direction, then it be, can be quite difficult to get the, uh, the tip of your catheter up above the septum if you want to get the bile duct. And in this case, this is a particular advantage for the wire-guided cannulation, where the tip of the guide wire is actually the leading edge and has a much better opportunity to get above this septum if it's plastered on the, on the top wall. So that's uh, various factors in, in terms of the septum. What you saw uh, with Jacques earlier today is um, what we call negotiating the S-curve. Uh, this is uh, one of the major factors for failed cannulation. And the bottom line is, is the, the, the problem is, is that it's not a straight shot. And there's actually three different maneuvers that you have to make uh, to negotiate the intraduodenal part uh, of the papilla. Uh, the first maneuver you have to make is one that is going cephalad. So you have to go uphill a certain distance uh, as the initial part of the cannulation. Then you have to go downhill. So the second part is downhill. And that's what, uh, what Jacques was uh, describing today, uh, where you pull back on the scope, you usually go left on the left, right, and you actually have to aim down to make this second uh, part of the maneuver in this uh, S-shaped uh, uh, papilla. And then finally, once you make that second maneuver, now you have to go back uphill again and, and make a third maneuver to actually get into the, uh, to, into the bile duct. 
So if you look at this papilla here, you've got to go uphill for a ways, then you've got to pull the scope back and go left and the left right because you've got to go downhill and then you've got to go back uphill after that. And it's this S curve, I think, that probably is the most common uh, cause for failed cannulations, an inability to recognize the anatomy and an inability uh, for the end end uh, endoscopist to negotiate all three of those different maneuvers. And if you um, look at reasons for failed selective cannulation, these are uh, the main reasons, at least in my opinion. Uh, the first one, as I mentioned earlier, is this up and over, this S-shaped uh, 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 conformation of the papilla. Uh, and basically, I think the, uh, the endoscopist fails to recognize that there's this S-shape, and, um, and, and they don't uh, correctly negotiate uh, the area. Uh, a second reason for failed cannulation is an aberrant relationship uh, between the biliary and pancreatic orifice. Uh, and uh, in my um, personal situation, this is actually a, a very common uh, cause uh, for me to fail uh, to be able to successfully selectively cannulate, uh, that there is actually an aberrant relationship uh, between the pancreatic and the biliary orifice. Uh, this, a third reason is that there's actually separate orifices, uh, and you don't recognize that, and uh, you keep entering the uh, pancreatic orifice, and you don't realize that there, in fact, is a separate orifice altogether. It was mentioned earlier uh, by Jacques uh, and, and also earlier um, uh, that uh, a periampulary diverticulum uh, can be a cause for, uh, for failed cannulation. And again, it's a matter of negotiating the, the anatomy, the curved, uh, distorted anatomy uh, that's present. And then finally, it's uh, what I call the Sharpe papilla. Uh, this was described nicely in an article in endoscopy that uh, Michael Burke uh, co-authored. Um, uh, but basically, you've got uh, a papilla that has multiple folds, and it has no what I call turgor to it. It has no firmness to it. And so whenever you press uh, against the papilla at all, it just folds. It collapses and folds. There's no turgor to it. And uh, the Sharpe papilla is another reason for, uh, for failure. And actually, you can now correlate the three steps of cannulation that I mentioned and you can correlate that with why we fail to cannulate. So in terms of engaging the orifice, if there are separate openings, uh, then you'll have a failed, uh, potentially have a failed cannulation because you can't, uh, uh, you can't successfully do step one, which is engaging the orifice. The second one is access to the correct side of the septum. If there's an aberrant relationship between the biliary and pancreatic duct, or if there is this uh, plastered septum, uh, then you uh, fail to get on the proper side of that septum and you can't get the selective cannulation. And then the third uh, step uh, of cannulation is negotiating the intraduodenal portion. And the, uh, the up and over uh, is one example of uh, where this step fails. The Sharpe papilla is another example of why that fails. And then the periampulary diverticulum is the third. So you can correlate each of these steps of cannulation uh, with the reasons uh, for failure. And here's just a couple of examples. This was a case I did recently, and this is a separate orifice. Uh, you've got the uh, pancreatic stent uh, in the pancreatic orifice. You can see obvious uh, uh, ampullary tissue, and then you've got a, a sphincterotomy here, but the bile duct was up here. So an example of separate openings. All of you have seen hundreds of examples of periampulary diverticula. Uh, this is the Sharpe papilla. Uh, this is the Sharpe dog uh, that I named uh, this uh, after. Uh, and you can almost uh, picture this as being the papilla. And uh, what you've got to do now is you've got to negotiate your way around uh, all these folds. And again, whenever you push uh, on the papilla at all, it just sort of collapses, creates a lot of different angles and so forth, and can be very, very difficult uh, to cannulate. And then this is an example of the up and over. Uh, again, you've got to no negotiate up, then you've got to go down, and then you've got to go up again in all three, these three uh, up and over examples. And then here's an example of the aberrant relationship. Uh, here is the normal relationship. If you do a biliary sphincterotomy, you'll find the, the pancreatic orifice on the right-hand side. Here is a stent in the pancreatic duct, and the biliary orifice is actually at 5 o'clock uh, relative to the pancreatic orifice. So an example of a aberrant relationship between the, the biliary and the pancreatic orifice. So in my estimation, at least in, in my opinion, if you want to improve your cannulation rate, you need to become a papologist. 
Uh, that means you need to take some time to study the papilla uh, before you begin cannulating. And the technique and maneuvers that you use uh, will uh, depend on the conformation of the papilla. So you should study the papilla, and then uh, you should also realize that no one technique fits all situations, and you need to match the situation uh, of cannulation. You need to match your cannulation technique uh, to the papilla. You may want to use wire-guided technique. You may want to use uh, what uh, I think uh, Horst and Jacques uh, usually use and which was demonstrated earlier today, where you gently inject uh, some contrast to get an idea of what the, uh, the distal bile duct and pancreatic duct, what the conformation is uh, first, and then begin the cannulation. I don't think it really matters uh, what you do. Uh, it matters what's comfortable to you, and it matters um, uh, that you study the papilla. And I've shown on the slides here just an example of uh, take some time to, to push away the folds that may be covering the papilla, because here, this, originally, this papilla originally looked like it was just a nipple and would be very simple, but we removed the folds, and you can see now that there is definitely some up and over uh, portion uh, to this papilla, so it affects um, uh, exactly how you cannulate. Now, I've attached some names to papillas. I want to show you some examples of papillas, and uh, the first papilla that I want to show you is the uh, Michael Burt papilla. This is what I call a straight shot, uh, and this the, is a, a situation where the papilla looks like a nipple, uh, and generally there is not very much intraduodenal segment, and it's generally a relatively straight shot. This falls on a difficulty scale, a scale of about 3 out of 10, with 10 being most difficult. I named it the Michael Burke papilla, not because uh, it's an easy papilla to cannulate, and, and Michael Burke has limited uh, abilities. It's not that at all. Uh, the reason I named it the Michael Burke is because Michael is a, uh, an advocate of the wire-guided uh, technique. And in my opinion, uh, this is an ideal situation to use the wire-guided technique. All you have to do is uh, place the, uh, your uh, sphincterotome or your catheter a little bit away from the papilla and then just advance the guide wire and advance it in the 11 o'clock position and generally it will go straight and uh, it will go straight on in. So that's the, uh, the Michael Burke uh, papilla. And this is just an example. Uh, this happens to be a manometry catheter, but you can see how straightforward that catheter goes in uh, in a situation where uh, the papilla is more sort of nipple-like. It's a relatively uh, straightforward cannulation. Now, the up and over, I've named the Jacques Devier papilla, and uh, for good reasons. Uh, I think as I've traveled around and watched uh, Jacques and many other uh, endoscopists uh, do ERCP, I think Jacques uh, has the, the best uh, sort of mindset uh, for the up and over maneuver. Uh, you, you got to see him uh, work at it today um, on, on his papilla. Uh, but I call it the Jacques Devier papilla. It is an up and over maneuver. When you see any one of these papillas that I show on this slide, you can be guaranteed that it's not going to be a simple advance the catheter straight away, advance the guide wire straight away, and get on in. You're going to have to do some maneuvering partially up and then pull the scope back and go left and left right and then down and back up. So uh, I've named this the Jacques Devier papilla. It's an up and over, and it uh, generally is a difficulty scale of sort of eight or nine. Now, in, um, uh, in a celebration of our, one of our chairmen, this is the Todd Barron uh, papilla. Uh, this is uh, status post a, a sphincteroplasty, and uh, a word has it from the Mayo Clinic that Todd has never failed to cannulate uh, in this uh, situation. I'm making a joke of Todd. This is a difficulty scale of zero, and Todd is smiling because he's just cannulated this papilla. I'm making a joke with Todd because I'm about to show some examples of a three French pancreatic stent, and this is going to get Todd all riled up, and so I wanted to preempt any, any actions on Todd's part, and so I named this patulant papilla the Todd Barron papilla. So in terms of principles of cannulation, uh, these are some of the thoughts that I have. Uh, study the papilla, as I said before, and match the, the uh, technique to the conformation of the papilla. I think you can use a wire-guided technique or you can use a gentle injection technique. I think both 
uh, can be effective, and, and neither one is, uh, uh, is taboo, if you will. I think uh, I will generally make three to five attempts uh, at uh, cannulating, and then I change my technique. Uh, and I think to, to do the same thing over and over and over and over again, I think is not correct. If uh, three to five times, if you've not uh, been able to make the selective cannulation, change something. Be gentle uh, on the papilla, uh, and uh, do not force uh, the, uh, the cannula or the guide wire or anything else uh, into the papilla. Uh, it just distorts the papilla, which does two things. Uh, it creates more angles, and I've tried to draw this here. It's not a very good drawing. But here's a situation where you're not distorting the papilla, and you can see here that you've got a chance, at least, of having a relatively straight shot. If you push hard with a catheter against the papilla, you essentially create folds within the papilla. And now to negotiate either your catheter or a guide wire through all these folds is very, very difficult. And as you saw with uh, Jacques today when he was uh, giving instructions to the nurses, uh, if you, if you uh, uh, push on the papilla very hard and then you cram a guide wire in, uh, there's lots of chances for tearing the mucosa, getting submucosal injections, etc. Et so be gentle with the papilla and don't force it. And then limit your time. I think to spend an hour trying to cannulate is, is just wrong uh, in this day and age. Uh, there are ways uh, around that, and we shouldn't spend so long doing it. This is uh, what I call the, the cram and inject uh, system. Uh, don't force the cannula uh, into the papilla uh, and then squirt. And this is uh, my example of uh, an injured papilla. Uh, this is uh, Paul Falkins, who had some recent um, uh, surgery on his nose. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, using this as an illustration of a papilla. So this is what you get when you cram and squirt. So the Hawes axioms on cannulation, uh, the hole is never too small uh, or too tight. Uh, so it's never a matter of, uh, uh, of having something uh, that is a very, very small. The smaller it is, the sharper it is, the sharper it is, there's more chance for a submucosal injection. It also, a cannulation never depends on pushing hard. You never have to have superior strength to get a cannula in the papilla. It's never a matter of pushing harder. Cannulation boils down to axis and angle. Uh, those are the only two parts of cannulation that are important. If you're distorting the papilla, pushing on the papilla, you should stop and you should change your technique. And when you're insinuated, uh, the best way to get selective bile duct cannulation is actually to tip up with a scope. What everybody wants to do is the cannula is coming out, the cannula is touching the roof of the papilla, and what everybody wants to do is push on the catheter, which just pushes the papilla, uh, pushes the catheter further into the roof of the papilla. But actually when you insinuate, if you'll come up on the up-down, it actually drives the catheter in a more uh, correct angle uh, to get deep cannulation. What's the wire guided technique? We've heard a lot about that. It's basically using a multi-lumen cannula, uh, usually a sphincter tome, and a hydrophilic tip wire. The wire should be protruding about one to three millimeters beyond the tip of the cannula. You engage the tip of the wire and the cannula into the papillary orifice, and then you gently uh, advance the wire. And the duct that you have is selected by the trajectory of the wire, uh, not by injection. And that's basically uh, what it is. Now, failed cannulation, if you do have a failed cannulation, um, there are a number of ways that you can overcome it. And I don't have time to review all of those. You saw one of them today with Jacques, where he put a guide wire into the pancreatic duct that uh, straightens the, um, uh, the papillary uh, area and you can oftentimes get selective cannulation. That, for me, that hasn't been so successful. Uh, maybe I'm just not gifted at that particular maneuver, uh, but that's certainly one way you can do it. What I want to talk just a little bit about um, is actually what I call access sphincterotomy, uh, because uh, this is a technique that I think is, um, is important. Uh, this is a, a diagram of my technique for an access sphincterotomy. Uh, if I have failed to cannulate uh, selectively the bile duct, I place uh, a three French stent uh, that has a single pigtail in the duodenum. Uh, what this pigtail does is it sort of pulls down on the papilla. I, uh, I deploy the uh, pigtail so it's distal to the papilla. It sort of pulls down on it, and then it uh, allows you access to the papilla here. 
and then I've done uh, my cut uh, to gain access in this manner as I've shown. This is just a short video uh, of the technique. In this particular case, I put in a, a five French stent rather than a three French stent because this particular duct had a, a 360 degree curve and I didn't want to take that entire curve uh, in getting around. This is a needle knife um, and uh, I'm just inserting it now at the junction of the papilla and the, uh, the stent and then I'm working my way up in the, uh, in the uh, direction of the bile duct. I go slow, uh, I take my time, uh, I uh, expose the area uh, and you'll see me uh, expose it just a little bit more. And um, now I'll, I'll just observe here just a little bit. I'm going to cut down now on this uh, pancreatic stent a little bit. Uh, and I'll explain in just a minute why I think the pancreatic stent is so important uh, in doing this technique. So I'm looking around now. I'm clearing the, the air. I'm going to do a little bit more cutting. You can see some bulge happening here, which is actually the, the, the sphincter segment that's sort of bulging out. I'm going to cut up just a little bit more. And again, it's, uh, it's controlled. I have the duodenal, duodenum paralyzed. Uh, there's uh, very little movement. Uh, the pancreatic stent is in place. Um, and so if something happens, uh, if I have to bail out of the procedure, then I have the protection of the pancreatic stent. And then it's just a matter of gentle probing. Uh, and generally, uh, there uh, you get yourself into the bile duct, uh, and you can confirm that um, uh, with, uh, with uh, radiology. So why am I so adamant about placement of a pancreatic stent prior to this uh, access sphincterotomy? I think a, a number of reasons. It provides a direction for your cut uh, so that you know what direction you need to cut in, and it keeps you uh, sort of pointed in the right direction. It provides a platform, uh, and it limits the depth of your cut, uh, and it stabilizes the, uh, the needle of the needle knife. It protects the pancreas, which is uh, critically important if it's a high-risk patient. Uh, if you fail to get in the bile duct, if bleeding occurs, if something happens uh, with a patient uh, in the middle of the procedure and you have to stop, uh, then uh, you've got the safety of the pancreatic stent. And it's always easy to visualize the biliary sphincter if there's an aberrant relationship with the pancreatic sphincter if you've uh, put in a pancreatic stent. And this is just another example, and I, I think, unfortunately, I don't have time to, to show that. I did want to just show this very, very brief video where we get some bleeding. And um, again, just to illustrate that with this technique uh, where you have a stent in place, if you do get some bleeding, um, again, you've got the stability of having this pancreatic stent in place. Uh, it's a protective mechanism. It gives you uh, something uh, to provide you direction and balance and orientation. And uh, here you can see it's not a lot of bleeding. Uh, we get this stopped. But you can see here that uh, I've got the time. I don't have to worry about the, uh, the pancreas, et cetera. I can wash. Uh, I don't have to worry about burning uh, the pancreatic orifice and trying to get this stopped. And I think it provides some stability to the situation and is one of the reasons uh, that I'm a, an advocate of it. So uh, I think that um, uh, basically cannulation, uh, again, as I said before, is, a, is, a, uh, is an art. It's not a science. There are many, many, many other aspects of cannulation that I could have presented. I tried to present some of the basic things that I think about. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, you should uh, learn from the masters. Uh, I've had the opportunity to be um, uh, in Egypt, in this case, with, uh, with Horst and, uh, and Jacques and, and Sylvia. And uh, uh, this is just an illustration that sometimes teamwork uh, is very, very helpful, and that's certainly the case with cannulation. And in the end, if you follow these techniques, then you'll be a happy sailor as we were today, uh, this day on the, on the Nile River in, uh, in Egypt. So uh, Hans, with that, I'll stop. And uh, thank you very much for your attention.